minister said to, pointed to the three of us and said, follow me. So he was a minister, and I'm respectful, I'll, I'll follow a minister. So he goes around the back entrance of the construction site and sits down in front of the bulldozers. And he says, here, sit down with me. So <laughs> the three of us sat down with him, <laughs> and we were all arrested. I never knew you followed orders so easily. Uh, so we, uh, oh, the minister, you know, <laughs> didn't respect. So, uh, so we ended up all being arrested and spending the, spending the day in jail in, in the tombs. Uh, and so that was actually my introduction to protest movement. And uh, from a complete stranger who, uh, and I didn't even know Mark Nason or, or Will Stein uh, at the time, but I got to know them better over the How period of time. How did you end up at Columbia University being a student there? Oh, well, I was a scholarship student uh, from, uh, uh, from out of Frank Killian High School in, in Brooklyn. And, and uh, I don't really know how. I guess my college advisor had never heard of Columbia uh, before. And what year were you? I was class of 68. That was my senior year. So this was it. This yeah. was the senior year. Yeah. And, but I think the important thing is to understand that the, the land battle, because as Bill and I were talking about this uh, earlier, there has not been much of an analysis of the role of urban universities uh, in, in their cities and in the this university expansion is a huge problem in most major cities yes. around the country where private universities exist, because they're always gobbling up land uh, for their own private interests that are cloaked as a public interest, an educational interest. Uh, but they are huge landowners, and they have enormous impact on what happens to the communities around them, whether it's Johns Hopkins or University of Pennsylvania or Yale or, or any of these, uh, Harvard, any of these universities. They're all involved in the same thing. Uh, and I think one of the interesting things that came out of the strike, and I think, uh, is this pamphlet that the students produced in the midst of the, uh, of the strike uh, called Who Rules Columbia? Uh, and somebody actually just gave me an old copy uh, about a week ago, and I started to read it. And it is really an extraordinary analysis, uh, not only of corporate influence on a university, but also on land policy on the university. And uh, it's, uh, it's particularly interesting because even in this pamphlet, it talks that 40 years ago, Columbia University was planning a major expansion into Harlem between 125th and 135th Street uh, for a uh, research park for military uh, uh, research. Uh, now the university is only now completing that plan, only they've turned it into a bioscience uh, center instead of a defense research center. But one of the things that we've done since this pamphlet, I think, would be helpful for many students who are involved in, in campus activities, is we've taken the entire pamphlet and put it in a PDF file, and we're putting it on the Democracy Now! website. So anyone who wants to download it uh, can do so. Uh, and uh, it's an incredibly uh, deep analysis of government and, and corporate involvement in university policymaking, uh, specifically geared around Columbia University. And it begins with a quote of Charles Beard. Uh, Upon his resignation from Columbia University, October 9th, 1917, I have been driven to the conclusion that the university is really under the control of a small and active group of trustees who have no standing in the world of education, who are reactionary and visionless in politics, narrow and medieval in religion. Their conduct betrays a profound misconception of the true function of a university in the advancement of learning. 1917. And among those who wrote this, it was published by North American Congress of Latin America, NACLA, which is also now celebrating its 40th anniversary, um, was Michael Clare. Michael Clare, Stu Goddard, you know, it's enormous. It, considering that this is long before there were search engines and, and the internet, the depth of research that was done uh, on the investments in Colombia, the land ownership, it's, it's really an extraordinary document uh, uh, of, of research and analysis. Well, we're going to talk about how the strike and occupation progressed, uh, what it meant when the police were brought in with our four guests. Three of them were students at the university. Uh, one, uh, some call an outside agitator, and he was Please. Tom Hayden. <laughs> I was the chair, the elected chair, of the mess building commune, and I was arrested <laughs> with everyone else. <laughs> this is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. We'll be back in a minute. Hey.
Watching capitalism gun down democracy They've had this funny effect on me I guess bold move. Ani DeFranco here on Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman with Juan Gonzalez. Our guests are Bill Sales. He's now chair of African American Studies at Seton Hall University. Are you correcting me, Bill? Yeah, past chair. Past chair of the African American Studies yes. Department at Seton Hall. Uh, Augustin <laughs> Reichback, now a New York State Supreme Court judge in Brooklyn. And Tom Hayden, a former California State Senator. He was founder of S. Students for a Democratic Society, and has a new book called Writings for a Democratic Society, the Tom Hayden Reader. Um, we are also, for our radio listeners who can't see today's TV broadcast, showing lots of video and photographs. Um, in fact, one of them that we just showed before the break was a photograph. Was it you, Tom, dragging Francis Fox Piven into the math building? Yes, I was dressed in a nice shirt, tie. She was a professor. She was the author of a, a very influential book on social movements, on sit-ins, on industrial labor strikes, and she wanted to see for herself. And I believe today she's the head of the American Association of Sociologists. I hope that doesn't get her in trouble with David Horowitz, but <laughs> there she is being brought into the math building to observe. And, and of course, you were in math, which was uh, always seen as the uh, the the radical the radical occupation uh, building. Uh, what, what were some of the groups that were in there in the math? Well, there was up against the wall, mother. Can I say that? No. <laughs> and uh, Abby no. Hoffman. There's a judge in the room. Some diggers. Uh, I don't know. It was mainly students, and mm. and um, most of what went on was to uh, you know get peanut butter, get sandwiches, uh, be prepared for tear gassing and beatings. And uh, uh, it was a very, it was an intense but temporary community. And it was just a lot of discussion and uh, an unforgettable experience. Bill I think. Sells, was there division between the different student groups and especially between black and white? Hamilton Hall, after the first day, was occupied by black students. Uh, <clears throat> we felt that it was necessary that we have a very clear and distinct identity inside of the whole demonstration. That being said, there was never any differentiation between demands that we advanced and demands of, of, of the larger strike. Secondly, we tried to make clear that the fact that we were in that building exclusively in no way should be interpreted as a split. Uh, it was an attempt at the time to suggest that there were divisions, animosities, and what have you. There you couldn't said, be anything further from the truth. There were a lot of Harlem residents there, too, is that? Well, it was really a community takeover. There were representatives of many movement organizations from the community core from Harlem, representatives of the Ocean Hill Brownsville. Uh, 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 community school board struggle. There were students from NYU, from City College. Uh, there were, of course, West Harlem community organization, which was the primary community organization that took the lead in the opposition to the gym. So in addition to students who had Columbia IDs, there were at least an equal number of these community forces who stayed with us throughout the demonstration. And, and also, I think once we initially were all in, in Hamilton together, but there was a discussion between some of the SDS members, myself, that was uh, on the uh, coordinating committee, and SAS, and SAS said that they'd wanted to occupy the building 
themselves, and, and we agreed. And so it was actually a decision uh, between both groups, and then the SDS members moved out and started occupying other buildings throughout the campus, uh, because uh, I think that we understood that they needed to have uh, a, a building that could completely be identified and seen by the community as a rallying point and a base area uh, for the, the, the struggles uh, of the community itself. I, I would just That's add right. that, that um, while certainly the specific demands were what motivated people, um, there was some transcendent 